I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the uh, next uh, today's uh, graduate student provost lecture on Joel Levine from the Graduate School of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior. And I've also been a long time term member and associated with the program of molecular pharmacology. So today's speaker is Luisa Escobar Hoyos from that program. And as is uh, usually the custom at uh, these provost lectures, I'm going to let her advise her, Ken Troyer, do the actual real introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. So I uh, had the chance to uh, study and review Luis's uh, uh, CV uh, earlier today. Uh, it was complex, complicated, and impressive. Uh, Luis has got a long history as an educator. She was a high school teacher, grades 6 through 11, for the Compestory Americana School in uh, her home country of uh, Colombia. From, uh, and at the same time, she served as a teaching assistant in molecular biology at the Pontifica Universidad Javeriana in uh, Bogota. From uh, 2009 to 2010, she served as an assistant professor of biochemistry at the Universidad del Valle, Colombia. Uh, Luis has received a, uh, an impressive number of awards in her brief career. Uh, she's a Fulbright Scholar. She has a, a tuition scholarship from Stony Brook. Um, in September uh, 2012, she received the Best Poster Award from the Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology Annual Symposium at Stony Brook and also received in the same month the Kevin King John Miller Travel Scholarship Award to support her uh, uh, participation in the uh, annual meeting of the American Society of Cytopathology. Um, the following month she received a uh, NIH Travel Award which uh, enabled her to attend the International Papillomavirus Conference in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, Luisa's had uh, grant support when she was in Columbia, serving as a co-I from two different grants from basically the NIH of Columbia, Colensius. Uh, she's given a number of uh, presentations uh, internationally, including five board presentations that she had late last year uh, for the American Society of Cytopathology and for the International Papillomavirus Meetings. She has uh, authored uh, three papers based on her work in Columbia that are in press now. Uh, a fourth one uh, from her work in Columbia that is in preparation. But more important than any of those, uh, her uh, current paper, which is probably going to be submitted uh, within the week related to her uh, thesis work that she's uh, been doing in my lab. So it's uh, been a real treat to have uh, Lisa as a member of the lab, and uh, I hope you all enjoy her presentation. Sure, I will. Okay, first I want to thank the committee for inviting me to give it this talk today. And for all of you for being here, it feels like family um, with this presentation. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you the story about a protein, keratin 17, and two applications that we have found. The first one, helping us in the diagnosis of the precancerous lesions in the cervix. And the second application, that it helps us to, pro to give a prognosis of the patients that already have the cervical cancer. So first, I'm going to talk about a general overview of cervical cancer and its causative agent, the human papilloma virus, or HPV. Then I'm going to talk about of keratin 17 as a diagnostic marker for the precancerous lesion. Then the same keratin 17 also with the function of prognostic marker and conclusions and future directions. Do you want to do it all then? The presentation. Okay, so I hope the slides help a little bit. So the cervix is the tissue that is located in the, gen in the female genital tract between the uterus and the vagina. F 
Furthermore, the cervix is divided in the endocervix, which is more the internal part near the uterus, and the ectocervix, which is more near the vagina. If we zoom up in the ectocervix, we see that the ectocervix is lined up by two types of epithelium. The first one is the stratified squamous epithelia, which is more to the lower part, and then on the endocervix is lined by columnar um, simple epithelium. And this transition from a stratified epithelium to a simple epithelium is called the squamocolumnar junction. In here, in the squamocolumnar junction is where it's believed that all the cervical cancers arise. In this cartoon, what I have is, um, this is the stratified epithelium of that ex exocervix. And normally, in the normal cervix and the cervical mucosa, the cells are fully mature, they don't divide or grow anymore, and they protect the cervix. However, when cervical cancer starts arising, these cells that normally didn't divide, they, become divide, they start be dividing, and these immature cells will start covering all the layers of the stratified epitheliums, and once they reach the capacity to invade, that's when it's uh, called cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, as we see here, um, it has been, it's preceded by two stages, and pathologists or doctors have, did, have named them as the squamal intraepithelial lesions, or also known as SILs. And we have the l seal, which is the low grade, and then the high seal, which is the high grade. Normally from the l seal, patients can go back to the normal cervical mucosa, or even from the high seal, go back to the l seal, and most of the high seals will progress to cervical cancer. So what's the incidence of cervical cancer in the United States? According to the American Cancer Society, it's believed that more than 12,000 new cases will arise on this year, and 4,000 of them will die. So here in this graph, what we have is the incidence of cervical cancer in the last three decades or so, and here's the rate in 100,000 patients, per people, sorry. And what we have here is that the incidence of cervical cancer has decreased over the last three decades, almost to a 60% decrease making cervical cancer the eighth leading cause of, of death of cancer in women. However, the statistics worldwide is pretty different. Cervical cancer, um, here in this map, what we have is against the incidence in 100,000 women, and the shading is the, this, the incidence. This red shading showing us that there's a higher incidence in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa compared to other developed countries. So worldwide, cervical cancer is the second leading cause of death in women um, with half a million case, new cases per year and half of this dying every year. So what are the risk factors of, that cause cervical cancer? So as most of you know, um, cervical cancer is caused by a persistent infection with a virus, human papilloma virus or HPV. More than 150 have been described and 40 of them are known to infect the genital tract of the females. Um, and they are believed to cause 90 or almost 100% of all the cases of cervical cancer. This HPV virus is a DNA virus that once it goes into the stratified epithelium, it reaches the basal part of the epithelial, it causes the cells to divide and grow, and then it spreads the, it spreads the infection to other cells. So in this, figure what we have is an actual, tum an actual tissue from a, from a patient, and in this side we have the normal epithelium, and on this side we have the HPV infected epithelium. All the brown stain or all the brown dots that you see here is marking cells that are dividing and growing. Normally, in the normal epithelium, it should be only in the basal part. However, when the epithelium gets infected with HPV, it makes it, uh, the cells divide and grow. And how does HPV makes the cells grow and divide? It has two proteins, Ig6 and E7. And let me introduce two terms. Oncoproteins are those proteins that have the capacity to promote cell division and grow. And on the other side, we have the tumor suppressor proteins, which are the proteins that do the opposite. They slow down the growth, and they also make the cells die whenever it's necessary. So E6 and E7, they act as oncoproteins E6 specifically, what it does, it inhibits P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and a tumor suppressor protein, and then it turns the cell to uh, D, 
divide, um, to divide. Now, E7 also has the capacity to inhibit another tumor suppressor, another tumor suppressor protein, retinoblastoma, which causes the immortalization of cells. And these two processes combined make the cells turn into cancer cells. However, HPV infection alone does not, ex does not um, explain the causes of cervical cancer because most women that get infected with HPV do not develop the cervical cancer. So now that I have introduced HPV, and if we go back to the progression of cervical cancer, the L cell is basically known as a transient HPV infection and is a benign condition. However, when there is a persistent HPV infection, the high seal is also known as the precancerous lesion. Um, in most of the cases, if not treated, they will develop cancer. And the L cells, most of the cases, 90% of the cases, will clear the infection spontaneously without any treatment. So there are two ways that we can stop cervical cancer from developing. The first one is to diagnose and treat precancerous lesions that I'm going to refer as the high seals before they become cancer. So treat them over here. And the other strategy to stop the number of cervical cancer cases is to prevent precancerous lesions, uh, the appearance of these cancerous lesions. So right now I'm going to focus on how do we currently diagnose and treat the precancerous lesions. So in public health, the cervical cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatments follow this flow, which I'm going to introduce you step by step. So the screening part, it cons it's divided in two parts, the pap test and the HPV test. So normally when females reach a, uh, an age of 21 and they are sexually, uh, sexually active, um, they start getting the pap test and basically um, cells are taken from the cervix with a brush and after they have been placed on, on the slide, they are looked under the microscope and if they look normal, they will just keep coming to the pap test every, every three years. However, during the pap test, the cells can also be classified as abnormal. In the abnormal classification, we can have the L seal, the high seal, the SCC, and there is also an intermediate classification, which is the ASCUS, when pathologists or cytopathologists can not be clear if it is a nail cell or a high cell, so it's an intermediate um, undetermined um, classification. In the United States, every year, three million cases of ASCUS are, class, are, are, are new, and, um, and nail cells is almost like 1.4 million. So when women get an abnormal cells from the pap test, except for the L cells, they will be remitted to the HPV test. So as I mentioned to you, HPV is the causative agent, but from the 40 uh, HPVs that are able to infect the genital tract, around 20 are divided into being a high risk HPVs. And these ones are because um, they are commonly found in cervical cancers. In the high risk HPVs, we have type 16, 18, 58, some 30s. And basically what the HPV test is doing is trying to find the DNA of this high risk HPVs. It's used most of the time when women get uh, an undetermined abnormal cell like the ASCUS, or in women that are uh, more older than 30 years and that have an abnormal pap test. When the HPV test is negative, women will go to the normal pap uh, screening and would not go into colposcopy. And there are many methods approved by the FDA to do the pap test, the HPV test, sorry. So there are many advantages from the HPV test. One and the most important one is that it has a high sensitivity, and meaning by sensitivity that it has a high ability to identify those positive high seal and SCC cases. However, on the other side, um, it has a poor specificity around 20%, and specificity meaning that the test, um, the capacity of the test to identify negative cases of the high seal and SEC. And this poor specificity is because most of the L seal cases are going to be positive when they get tested for the HPV. So, so far the HPV is telling us a great sensitivity, however it has a really poor specificity, and I will come back to this term sensitivity and specificity. So after an abnormal cell has been detected, detected except the L cell, there is an HPV positive female. It will be 
uh, then taken to colposcopy. Basically, in colposcopy, the doctors will have, um, they will use a colposcope to have a higher magnification of the cervix, and then by adding a little bit of acetic acid in a low concentrations, they will see that these lesions will turn into a white colorish where they can identify if there is any lesion. If they see any lesion, like with the whitish, they will take a biopsy, so a piece of this tissue, and then this tissue will go into um, diagnosis to a pathologist, and one is once it's determined that it's a high seal, the patient will get uh, a treatment, specifically it's a, it's a surgery to remove all, all of this lesion. So cervical cancer screening and diagnosis so far in the last 30 decades has helped us to decrease the number of cervical cancer cases. However, it still has its limitations. Aside from being a lot of steps in the process, it has poor specificity to rule out the high seals as we already mentioned it. Um, there are several colposcopies that women still go to colposcopies um, when they don't need it and also there's still a high mortality rate by this cause. Sometimes women get over-treated when they don't need it, and, most, and also very important is that all these process of screening and diagnostic, it could be very expensive with high costs. So because of the limitations of the cervical cancer screening, we asked ourselves the questions, so are there any specific proteins that are in each of these categories, the normal, the l seal, the high seal, and the SCC, that we could use to uh, screen for cervical cancer and to have a better diagnosis of these categories. So we conducted a study of two different um, parts. The first one was to try to identify and find those proteins that were specific for each one of these categories. And, by, and, we, and we collaborated with the proteomic center here at Stony Brook for this. Then the second, the second phase of the study was to validate that the proteins that, that we discovered here, we could see them and be useful for diagnosis. And after we did um, all the validation, we had to um, help another collaboration with the Biostatistical Consulting Corps to do all these analysis. So for the first part, the biomarker discovery. So we took tissues from patients that had the normal cervical mucosa, had the l cell, the high seal, and the SCC. And what we did is we um, dissected the lesions and taking only the cells that were specifically for the normal l cell, high seal, and SCC to have a uniform pool of cells. Um, and for this micro dissection, we use a, a laser capture microscope but that basically removes, once we select the area, it, it dissects these cells. So once we had collected the cells from each one of the categories, by the help with the proteomics score, they did a, a rigorous examination with the technology that we have here currently at Stony Brook, which is highly sensitive and quantitative to determine those proteins that were specific for each one of these categories. Um, and this is basically the whole step. From this proteomic analysis, um, we were able to identify in all the categories more than um, a thousand proteins that were um, sublocalized in different parts of the cell. And today I'm going to tell you the story about two proteins that we focus, focus from the cytoskeleton. So in this table what we have um, are the quantification, the number of the protein, in this case keratin-4 and keratin-17, in each one of the categories. As, as we can see from the numbers, keratin-4 is highly expressed in normal, it decreases in l cell, and then it's barely undetectable in high cell and in SCC, showing us that maybe keratin-4, it's decreasing and it's showing a progression as we go into cervical cancer. On the other hand, keratin-17 was showing a different pattern, an opposite pattern to keratin-4, and the number of, of its quantification were increasing, predict, making us predict that it was a marker for l cell, high cell, and SCC. So how we were going to validate, we already had two proteins that were candidates um, for our diagnostic validation, and then we went and tested for these proteins if we can find them again on the tissues by another method. Um, in order to construct, in order to have a high number of tissue from patients 
um, and make it a high throughput type of assay, first we construct the tissue microarrays. And basically, per category from the l cell, we took 25 cases of different patients that had the lesion, and then we took um, cores from each one of these patients and we put them on a single block in order so we can process a whole number of cases on a single slide. And we constructed for each one of the categories, the L cell, the high cell, and the SCC, we constructed a TMA. Um, in order to, the method that we use to stain and to recognize if these proteins, keratin-4 and keratin-17, were expressed in these tissues were immunohistochemistry. And normally this assay, it's commonly used in diagnosis. How it works is when the protein, it's on the tissue, it's recognized by a primary antibody that is specific to recognize this protein. Then after we add another antibody and a complex, lastly we add DAB which later gets degraded into a brown, um, brown stain that it will tell us indirectly that the protein that we were looking for, it's there by the brown staining. In order to quantify the staining, the brown staining from the DAB, we use a semi-quantitative method a pathology scarring system where basically if this is the area of interest and all the cells are highly stained dark, we would call this 100% positive cells. And depending um, if it was a, a quarter of it or 10% or of the positive cells, we use this um, to score the expression of the proteins. And then we did several statistical analysis for this. So in here, we have the images, representative images, of each one of the stainings of keratin-17 in the normal, L-cell, high-cell, and SEC. And what we can see is that keratin-4, as predicted by the proteomic analysis, is lost in SEC. When we compare the quantification of keratin-4, um, we see that it's a statistically significantly decrease um, the expression of keratin-4 in SCC cases compared to normal L-cell and high-cell. Then we perform um, a statistical analysis which basically tells us how specific and how sensitive is this protein to, for being a diagnostic marker for cancer. And here what we have plotted is the specificity and the sensitivity of the assay. If we want to have a good biomarker, we're looking for uh, these dots to reach this upper corner. However, if we can see here, um, this one, um, keratin-4, only has a sensitivity of 68% and a specificity of 61% for cervical cancer, which is not optimal, um, making this one having our results but not making it a best diagnostic marker for cancer. So then we went ahead and we stained for keratin-17 and as predicted by the proteomic analysis, what we can see is an overexpression of keratin-17 specifically in high seal and SCC compared to the normal and the benign transition, um, HPV infection. And as we can see when we score it and when we compare it, there is a high uh, expression of keratin-17 in high seal and SCC, statistical significantly different from normal and LCO. Then we performed, again, the diagnostic analysis to see if it was a good diagnostic marker for high seal and SCC compared to the normal and the benign lesion. And what we see is that keratin-17 is a very good marker because it reaches this point where it has a high sensitivity and a high specificity for it as, to be in a diagnostic marker for the precancerous lesion and the cancer. We also performed the same statistical analysis, just comparing the premalignant precancerous lesion and the benign HPV infection. And we also see that it has a high sensitivity and a high specificity for this category. Overall, telling us keratin-17 could be a marker that is highly specific and highly sensitive for the precancerous lesions um, at the diagnostic level. Um, so then we asked ourselves the questions, and I told you before, there could be different types of HPVs that can infect the, the female genital tract. And we asked ourselves the question, does keratin-17 changes when there's different types of HPV infections? So what we did is we genotype our um, cervical cancer patients, and we determined what type of high-risk HPV they had. Most of the cases had 
HPV type 16, other patients had 18, and other one had uh, multiple infection. But when we compare patients that have different type of HPV infection, we don't see any difference in keratin-17 expression, letting us know that keratin-17 expression does not depend on the type of HPV um, uh, that the patient is infected with. Then we wanted to know, we already know that keratin-17 is highly specific and highly sensitive in the high seal and the cancer. And then we asked ourselves the question, is it expressed in other conditions, such as uh, patients that have an inflammation in the cervix, cervicitis, and a patient that has a wound healing process going on the cervix, other patients that are infected with other types of virus, with, such as the HPV, the herpes simplex virus, and what we can see is that expression of keratin-17 in all these other categories is lower than the expression of keratin-17 in the high CO and the SEC. <coughs> So, so far for this part one, we can conclude that keratin-17 has a low specificity, low sensitivity. Um, keratin-17 is highly specific and highly sensitive. It's not dependent on the HPV type. And it, its expression in cervicitis and wound healing and other processes is much lower than the high CL and the SCC. So for the future directions, so far we have used keratin-17 with on tissues, which makes it a, high, a candidate for the diagnosis of high seal. And for the future directions, we would like to test keratin-17, how it performs on the cytology sample, so on the pap test, if it's able also to predict a high seal um, at the screening level. Um, so now for the part two of the talk. Now, now that we have talked that keratin-17 was good for the diagnosis of high seal, I wanna switch gears a little bit and focus on what happens when the patient is diagnosed with cervical cancer and what's the management that they get. Um, so cervical cancer, the patients get treated according to the stage of the tumor. And basically the stage of the tumor refers to how much the tumor has spread. So if we can see here by these cartoons, T1 or stage one, this, the tumor is still confined to the cervix. In T2, it's already reaching the upper part of the vagina. T3 most of the time has reached already the lower part of the vagina. And then T4, when it has distant metastases, not only has invaded the whole cervix vagina, but it also metastases in long distance organs may appear. There are three types of treatment that cervical cancer patients get. It could be surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. So depending on the stage, they would get the surgery and sometimes radiation, surgery or radiation, radiation and chemotherapy, or both at the same time. So we wanted to see if keratin-17 was different when cervical cancer patients were in different stages. And what we have here is when we compare keratin-17 expression on patients with, at stage T1 or at stage 2 and 3, and we didn't find any difference in keratin-17 expression between cervical, cervical cancers at different stages. Then what we compared is we had some patients that um, didn't have the cancer on the lymph nodes and other patients that did have the cancer on the lymph nodes. And when we compared the keratin-17 expression between the two types of patients, we didn't find any statistical significant difference in keratin-17 expression. Then what we did is we took tissue from the from the primary tumor and tissue from the metastasis, and we compare if keratin-17 expression was different between the primary tumor and the MET, and we didn't find this difference. So then we asked ourselves the question, okay, so keratin-17 is not changing because of the stage, it's not changing between the primary of the MET. What is it, is it telling us something about the prognosis? And prognosis, what it means is an estimate of the likelihood of the likely course of a patient once it has been diagnosed and once it has been treated. So in, in other words, we can say in this case particular, how much is going to survive after treatment and diagnosis. So in this cartoon, what we have is that even patients that are at the same stage and they get the same treatment, not all patients respond the same way. This graph, what is showing, it's a Kaplan-Meier curve. And basically here we time the time after diagnosis and treatment and here the, the, the survival. And as we can see here from this um, lower curve is that some patients do not respond well to the 
uh, guideline therapy and they will die sooner from other patients that would survive. So even patients within the same stage do not respond the same way to the treatment. We, when we started seeing keratin-17 expression on cervical cancers, we determined that some patients had a light keratin-17 expression, not too dark, and we called them a low keratin-17. And on the other hand, there were other patients that had a really intense expression of keratin-17. So we asked ourselves the question if these differences were telling something us about the patient's outcome. So we gathered 60 cases of cervical cancer from different stages, and we compare if keratin-17 was telling us something about the prognosis. So when we compare cervical cancer patients from different stages that have low keratin-17, they have um, almost good survival compared to patients that have a high keratin-17, meaning that keratin-17 might be at the tissue level, might be telling us if a patient has a more likelihood of dying or surviving over time. Um, these, curves, these two curves were statistically significantly different. Um, also, the, this value, the hazard ratio, hazard ratio of 14.8, it's meaning that the patients that have already high keratin-17 have 15 more times likelihood of dying faster than the ones that have the low keratin-17. And if we can compare here the survival rates at five years, 60 months, and 120 months, we see how most of the time low keratin-17 has the same probability of survival, almost 100%, while this one almost drops to half. So the conclusions for the second part is that keratin-17 expression does not depend on the stage, on the lymph node status, or between the primary and metastases. However, when we divide our patients, if they express high or low levels of keratin-17, we can determine that keratin-17 is a prognostic marker and it's positive, positively associated with a poor survival in patients. So, so far, keratin-17 has showed us two potential applications, diagnosis for high seal and prognosis in the cervical cancer patients. And hopefully sometime if once a patient is diagnosed with cervical cancer and they get the surgery, maybe the stage and other factors plus a keratin-17 expression can help us determine what would be the best treatment for each patient, considering that some patients are well responders, some, pa some patients are low responders, some patients might have a more aggressive tumor that correlates with a poor prognosis. Also, we want to ask, um, respond, answer the question, does keratin-17 act as cononcoprotein, so a protein that is promoting cell growth and proliferation? Um, and, some, and right now we have some data that it might be sustaining and, and mediating more proliferation in cancer cells. So with this final slide, I want to acknowledge um, the people that have done all this possible because I'm presenting it, but this is a collaboration between all of us. And most importantly, I want to thank my advisor. Not only he's an expertise in biomarkers, in cervical cancer, and other diseases, but he's a great mentor. We have a lot of respect, very important conversations uh, between both of us. Uh, he's the first supporter of my goals, our, our, our scientific goals, personal goals, and he makes me a better scientist to go and, 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 and strive for them. Thank you very much. Um, the other people from the lab, Steph, Mallory, our technician, Sarah, who was previously with us, that helped us with all the staining, uh, the construction of the tissue microarray, the Jew lab also, uh, Dr. Zhu, Hayan, Mirvan, and Andrew. Thank you very much for your support. Our collaborations in the proteomics core, our collaborators in the biostatistical consulting core, my thesis committee, um, everybody from the pharmacology department, the staff, the administrators, the directors, the chair, and also my student mentor, Cindy, um, everybody at the pathology department, and our funding agencies. Thank you very much.